Hi everyone. So this is your last official lecture for invasion ecology. Today we're talking about impacts of invasive species. Um, this is certainly a topic that has come up a number of times throughout the semester uh, and ultimately is the reason that we care about invasive species because we anticipate or have observed that they have impacts on ecosystems, uh, that they have impacts on economics, such as crop systems or uh, agroforestry type of systems. They have impacts on human health um, and, you know, and ultimately the, the productivity of our agricultural systems. So the reading associated with this lecture is from a book uh, called Invasion Ecology. Um, so you're reading chapter nine from that book on the ecological impacts of invasive species. I like this book chapter because it covers kind of all of the different ecological aspects of invasions. Um, yeah, it's harder to, hard to find, you know, the, the breadth of ecological impacts from any single paper, although there are lots of really great individual papers about impacts of invasive species out there. All right, so we're gonna focus really on the ecological side of impacts, although as I mentioned, there are agricultural, there are um, human health, there are economic impacts that, um, that people care about as well. I'll mention a couple of those at the end. Um, what types of ecological impacts are there? Lots of them actually, and this is from a, uh, a framework that has been put together, uh, I guess, relatively recently. So this first paper was from 2014 trying to break down the different mechanisms by which invasive species could have impacts on either single native species, on ecological communities, so basically multiple native species. Uh, invasive species could impact the structure of ecosystems, so they could add or subtract vegetation canopy levels, they could add or subtract the complexity of that ecosystem, which affects Native, other native species habitat. They can also impact the function of an ecosystem. So altering things like the chemistry of the soils in an ecosystem. They can alter the way that water flows through an ecosystem or the way that water gets used in an ecosystem. They can modify fire regimes. So lots of different aspects uh, ranging from a sort of single species impact to multi-species to whole ecosystem impacts. And you guys for your um, team exercise are gonna be going through coming up with some hypotheses for these different impact mechanisms for different taxonomic groups that you'll focus on and then gather some data to see what you can find in terms of how different taxonomic groups impact native species, communities, or ecosystems. So before we can get to really talking about ecological impacts, we need to think about how we actually measure ecological impacts. So here are the, I would say there are three common ways that we measure ecological impacts. One is experimental, another is temporal, so over time, and a third is spatial, uh, so comparing different locations. Experimental approaches, so there's different ways that you could do an experimental approach with an invasive species to measure impacts. One is to basically go into an area, you can see this figure on the left is, or the picture on the left is a whole bunch of, um, you know, you can see all these little flags here. Um, those are demarcating the edges of plots that have been put down where some an experimental ecologist went out and actually weeded out the non-native invasive species in that area to see what happens to the native community afterwards. You could also do experimental additions of invasive species. So basically adding invasive propagules to a system to see how that affects the native community response. Um, or you can even create, so this one on top is an artificial community that has been created where you, know, you wanna know how native uh, species compete with invasive species. You can put your own you know, mix of those different plants together. Um, certainly in, uh, for experimental ecology, um, 
you know, if you study something that is small, that doesn't have a large range or that doesn't move a whole lot like plants or like invertebrates, um, to some degree, we can assess the effects of uh, vertebrates if we are looking, if we, you know, by building basically fences. So the rabbit proof fence in Australia or the uh, deer exclusions in the Northeast are ways to assess whether, uh, you know, particular browse or grazing of an animal is uh, affecting the vegetation. So experimental is one way to do it. Another way to measure impacts is, and this means that you would need to have sort of a before study, um, but is essentially to watch an invasion happen over time. So if you have some information about the native community from prior to when it was invaded, and then you go back and you look at what that community looks like after it was invaded, uh, then you can assess what the impacts were on that community. And then the third main way that we assess impacts are through spatial studies. So this is basically, you go out into a landscape, you find, you know, to the best of your ability, relatively comparable ecosystem types, one which is invaded and one which is not invaded. And you compare uh, the communities, or in this case, compare the litter depth in the, um, so that is, you know, the amount of, uh, leaf litter that accumulated in invaded areas versus uninvaded areas. So I want to go through these sort of different um, ideas of ecological impacts and what we're going to focus on are some of the, the main ones that are, are most studied, I would say, which is the effects of predation. So if you introduce an invasive species that is at a higher trophic level, um, and trophic level is basically just a word that refers to, you know, whether you're predator, whether you're prey, um, where you exist within the food chain. So if you're at a higher trophic level, you're like, you're going to eat things, <laughs> but you're not going to be a primary producer. Um, so you might prey on a, an animal, you might be an herbivore, you're eating a plant. Um, if you're at a lower tro trophic level, then you're more likely to be that primary producer and you're the one getting eaten. Uh, we're going to talk about competition. So that is generally at the same trophic level. So a plant versus a plant or, uh, you know, one invertebrate versus another invertebrate that don't eat each other. They're uh, competing against each other. We're going to talk about change in ecosystem structure and a little bit of change in ecosystem function. So if you look at these different things, um, and especially the predation versus competition, we can come up with some hypotheses about which of those is going to be more important for ecological impacts. And basically the hypotheses, and on these graphs, IAS stands for invasive alien species. So a hypothesis in terms of trophic interactions is that if the invasive species is at a higher level, that's this one over here on the left, and it's affecting a native species at a lower trophic level, then that invasive species is more likely to be consuming or preying upon the native community or the native population. And if you introduce a top predator into a new ecosystem, then it is often able to very rapidly deplete that prey item um, while the, the predator population grows quickly until eventually it's either mostly depleted that native prey population or it's depleted it to the point where they're not easy to come by anymore. So you have this nonlinear, but a, a nonlinear declining response is a hypothesis associated with uh, predator prey interactions. If you have invasive species that are at the same trophic level, then it's kind of a question mark as to what might happen. So if those two species are competing, there is some evidence out there that, you know, even with uh, a few individuals, you might have strong competition early on in an invasion, even with uh, invader abundance being low. But there's also kind of counter evidence in some cases that actually invasive species will just kind of, um, you know, not necessarily outcompete anybody early on until they reach a larger population level, and then maybe you see a decline. 
Or you could just have a really simple negative linear relationship whereby if you add one invasive species, then you're gonna subtract one uh, native species as uh, to make room within that ecosystem. When invasive species are at a lower trophic level, so this is if you introduce basically an invasive plant and you're looking at the effects on native herbivorous insects or herbivorous vertebrates, whatever the case may be, then we have kind of two counter hypotheses of what might be going on. One is that you might actually have a positive relationship because the invasive species acts as a resource, right? It introduces new habitat, it introduces a potential new food source for the native species. But in contrast, it might be a negative relationship. Um, and that hypothesis could say, well, it might be introducing a new food resource, but the native species being mostly specialists are not adapted to or haven't evolved to eat that new food resource. And really what you're seeing is that species out competing the good food resources. So, uh, the, so that those uh, herbivores are losing out because they're losing their preferred food source. Um, and in terms of habitat, you know, if you're altering the complexity or the structure of a habitat, um, that might be good for some species, but it might be bad for others. So it's, uh, you know, these are some hypotheses of options or possibilities of what the relationship might look like. Um, and so this is actually from a study that I was part of. So a couple of years ago, we set out to basically test those hypotheses. And these are results from a meta-analysis. So again, remember a meta-analysis is one where you find all of the different studies in this case that had a gradient of invasive species abundance. So like count of individuals or percent cover, if it was a plant, something like that. And measured that against a native, uh, either individual species or community level response. So again, that had to be on a gradient from, you know, numbers of individuals or percent cover, uh, what have you, biomass, etc. So these are the actual results, right? So remember, we hypothesized a nonlinear response when the invasive species were at a higher trophic level, and indeed, that's what we see. It's steeper early on and kind of levels out later. We weren't sure what was going to go on when we had invasive species at the same trophic level. And what we find is that it's a negative linear response. So no non-linearity associated with this one. Um, it just goes kind of straight down. As you add one invasive species, you subtract one native species. And when the invasive species were, were at a lower trophic level, we didn't find any significant response. So even though this looks kind of like it's negative, you can see these gray things, those are the error bars, and you could also draw a straight line straight through that. So that means that while there's like some suggestion that there might be a negative response, in fact, uh, we cannot say that with any kind of statistical confidence because our error bars are so large on that. So ultimately, if we go back to our um, original hypotheses, we found, uh, yep, that there's a nonlinear response when invasive species are at higher levels. There is a negative linear response, so the red bar, when invasive species were at the same level. And basically, we saw kind of a flat response when invasive species were at a lower level. And that might be because when invasive species were at the lower level, there are some cases where you have a positive response and some cases where you have a negative response. And if you add all of those things together in a meta-analysis, you basically get nothing at the end. All right, so what does this actually uh, mean? So some of the implications of this for management. If you are dealing with invasive an invasive species that is a top predator or a meso predator, as the mesopredator mean sort of like an intermediate predator, then you should be watching out for these rapid declines associated with the introduction of that species. And that means that catching them early, uh, you know, when we're dealing with vertebrates, when we're dealing with herbivorous insects, um, is really, really important because you're gonna have this rapid decline in the native, um, native species populations associated with that invasion.
If you're dealing with invasive competitors, so plants, for example, are good examples of this. If you're dealing with plants and you're worried about native plants, rare and endangered native plants, something like that, um, the good thing about having a linear response is that it actually doesn't matter when in the um, invasion process you treat that invasion, that you're going to have the same, you know, positive effect on the native community, whether you treat it down here or whether you treat it up here earlier on in the, the invasion. Of course, you will have lost a whole lot by the time you get here. So, um, so I don't mean that you won't have a uh, a loss if you if you wait, but um, you won't. You'll have. Uh, you basically are saving the same amount uh, of stuff, even if you're later in an invasion process. Um, and then it's kind of unclear what the impacts are, uh, or sorry, what the management implications are for dealing with an invasive species at a lower trophic level. Um, but again, a lot of times we're talking about plants affecting insects or affecting levels above it. And we know that plants versus plants were having a negative impact. So even if you're not cascading up trophic levels, you are likely having negative impacts against uh, other native species at the same trophic level. So here are just some examples of an invasive predator. So this is the lionfish invasion in the Caribbean. Lots of different studies of this, where as lionfish density increases, so this is zero lionfish to 12 lionfish per meter squared, if you can believe it, their lionfish are not as big as they, as they appear to be in all of these pictures. Um, and this is the change in native fish abundance, basically. So without lionfish, you're up here at three, and you've got this rapid decline, even with a single lionfish, because they are just voracious predators. They're eating all kinds of stuff, and then eventually kind of this leveling off later on. Um, another invasive predator example, just to, to add to the mix, are rats. So these are really well-known invasive predator introduced long, long ago with some of the original shipping around the world. So boats had rats on them. The rats ran off the boats when those boats docked in new places um, and had this kind of, uh, especially on islands, um, but also on new mainlands that they, they came into, um, just lots of delicious birds and delicious bird eggs, especially to eat in these places. So these are three different species of rats, Exulans, Nor Norvegicus, and Radis. So Radis, Radis <laughs> is the, um, all right, Radis is the, the genus and also the species in this case. And what you're seeing on here are the number of species that have been affected in terms of being suppressed by rat populations observed to go extinct or inferred to inferred basically means we don't see it anymore. We know that rats ate it, but we didn't actually observe the actual extinction due to rats. Um, land birds, seabirds are these two things, mammals and uh, reptiles, and then a little bit of amphibians down here. So most of these are bird impacts, land birds and seabirds, where the population is being heavily suppressed by rat invasive predators eating their eggs. Um, again, that goes back to, you know, sort of what we see for the lionfish and what we see for invasive top predators, really major impacts associated with them. Invasive competitors um, in terms of plants. So this is an example from a, from a plant. Another meta-analysis of looking at plant competition experiments. So again, remember, if we, if we remember back to all of our discussion about how invasive plants tend to have these traits that are linked to increased resources, um, that they come from places in the world that have more evolved or <laughs> higher diversity. Um, all of those lead to the idea that invasive plants are going to be superior competitors, right? So they have those invader traits like high fecundity and rapid growth, and they also have an evolutionary history of high competition. So what we would expect is that for the most part, invasive species are going to be more competitive against native species than native species would be competitive against invasive species. 
And this indeed is borne out in this meta-analysis, so lots of different experimental comparisons of how native plants reduce the biomass of invasive plants in competition. And on average, if you compare an invasive plant that's grown on its own with no competitors versus an invasive plant that's grown with some native competitors, the decline in biomass is about 18% on average across lots of different plant studies. But in comparison, if you look at a native plant grown on its own versus a native plant grown uh, in, in competition with an invasive, the natives are decreasing by 47%. So more than twice, like two and a half times as much effect of an invasive competitor than of a native competitor. So this supports that idea that invasive species are basically boss competitors. Um, the other thing that has been found is that even when you look at common native plants, we're seeing that invasive plants tend to have greater impacts per capita. So per capita means, you know, like as you add individual species, the impact of that addition of that single individual is higher if it's if you're adding an invasive than if you're adding a native species. So this was a really neat, neat study looking at uh, repeated surveys of wetland vegetation that have been done for um, sure what the time period is, but at least the last 20 years, something like that in the state of Illinois. And on the left side here are the effect of increasing native species abundance on all of the other species abundance. So you add 1% cover of a native species, what does that do to all of the other uh, native species, right? And so you would expect that as one species becomes more and more abundant, you know, something's got to give. So the other species are going to become less and less abundant. And indeed, you see this negative slope indicating that that is the case. But what's interesting is that these are the native species, but this is that same graph for non-native species, so non-native and invasive species. And this slope is quite a bit steeper, although it's a little hard to eyeball the two, but this slope, you take my word for it, is steeper than this slope, which indicates that if you add an, an additional non-native species, it is able to outcompete more of the native species than adding a native. So basically, it's not just that invasive plants can spread and become abundant that causes their impact, but it is also that they have a larger per capita effect, a larger impact as individuals uh, too, which means you get lots of impacts from them. And this is another interesting um, effect of invasions, and that is the idea of biotic homogenization. So this is a um, hypothetical graph where the left side are historical communities. So all of these letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, are all representing a native species. Um, and what an invasive species does in terms of homogenization, and homogenization just means making things more similar, more the same over time, reducing our overall diversity across different areas. So invasive species do two things. One is they add new species. So one and two on here are the non-native species that are getting added. So just by adding one to both of these and two to all three of these ecosystems, you have increased the similarity. So this number in the middle is sort of the similarity between all these three systems. You've increased the similarity just by adding the same species to all of those different plots. And the other thing that happens is if you have an invasive species that comes in, out competes or preys upon whatever the case may be, native species, then you lose some off, you know, maybe some of your rare native species. And that also leads to biotic homogenization because you've lost some of the uniqueness of these different uh, ecosystems. And when you combine those two things together to the present day community, we have both the addition of the same thing to all of these different plots, plus the loss of some of the diversity and the, the rareness um, 
from the native species leads to an overall increase, a sort of a double, doubling increase of similarity for all of those different communities. And so why is biotic homogenization a concern? Um, well, the idea is if everything is really similar to each other, then all of those different ecosystems are going to be vulnerable to the same sorts of things. So they might all those, you know, if the species, if the same species in all of these different communities, they might all be vulnerable to the same types of climate change, they might all be vulnerable to the same types of new pests or pathogens coming in, and therefore you might have, uh, you have the vulnerability of sort of a catastrophic loss of your ecosystem characteristics. There are some really interesting bottom-up effects, so these sort of indirect effects of species um, on the behavior, and this is one of the things that you'll read a couple of examples of in the, the Lockwood chapter. So this is an example when you have Brazilian fire ants in an ecosystem that uh, just like you and me, field mice are not real happy about being stung by fire ants, so they will tend to avoid them. And so that means, so this is an experimental study where they put seeds out for field mice, and they had areas where there were ants, and they had areas where there were no ants. And the field mice uh, got many more of the seeds when there were no ants around, because in the areas, even when there were seeds and ants, field mice were not real happy about foraging in those areas. So behavioral effects, but again, if you have ants in lots of different places that are stinging your mice, then the net result is that that mouse is spending a lot more time running away from ants and trying to find areas that are uninvaded than they are foraging and eating and building their population size. This is another interesting um, bottom-up effect, an indirect effect of earthworm invasions. So earthworms, um, you might know, in the Northeast are not native. So earthworms were essentially um, pushed out of the Northeast with the last glaciation. And the earthworms are really only here in the Northeast because we have introduced them. So through soils accidentally as uh, you know, dumping bait, um, that's how many of our earthworms have gotten here. And what's interesting about earthworms is that earthworms increase the nitrogen deposition. So they're really good at eating litter, right? So as you have more earthworms, you have less litter volume because the earthworms have eaten that leaf litter, turned it into uh, nutrient rich soil. Um, and ultimately that is an ecological cascade or one of these um, invasional meltdown examples where you end up with earth, high earthworm biomass, you have more nitrogen in a system, and that facilitates the invasion of these um, invasive plants that require lots of resources and can really take advantage of that additional nitrogen. Um, the other thing that earthworms can do is that increased burrowing might also disrupt some of the native associations between soil mycorrhizae and the um, plants that they have a symbiotic relationship with. So could also, in addition to facilitating invasions, could also directly harm um, native species. Uh, and this is another example that we've talked about before, Myrica fea, the, um, I think it's called a fire tree in Hawaii. So this is a species that was native to um, the Azores, I believe, also a volcanic island, happens to be a nitrogen fixing tree. Another example of in areas where you have the invasion of this species, much more nitrogen input than in areas where you don't have the invasion. And that kind of cascades down to create huge amounts of soil resources for mainly used by invasive species and the other invasive plants that come in there. Um, Another ecosystem function example is one related to water. So tamarisk uh, is an invasive plant. It's uh, East Asian in origin, I believe, introduced as primarily as an ornamental. Um, it has these kind of pretty pink flowers. It's very feathery looking when it's in flower. Um, 
The estimates, though, so it's mostly invasive in the western U.S., all along the Colorado River watershed. Colorado River is the main source of water for Nevada, for Colorado, for uh, Southern California, for Arizona, so a lot of um, pressure for using Colorado River water. And it's estimated that tamarisk, relative to native vegetation, so the native riparian, the native wetland vegetation in this area would have been cottonwoods and willow trees. Um, it's estimated that uh, tamarisk uses about twice as much of, uh, transpires about twice the amount of water as the native um, vegetation does. So that means that rather than that water remaining in the Colorado River, it is being sucked up by the plants and, you know, basically um, out, outgassed essentially um, into the atmosphere. So that cost then in terms of that lost dollars is anywhere from $133 million to $285 million. And this is in 1998 dollars, so probably a fair bit more today. Um, also worth mentioning that there are positive impacts, of course, of invasive species. And a lot of the times, you know, this depends on what species we're talking about. So um, you know, any species that comes in is going to have impacts, positive and negative, depending on, you know, the winners and losers of that native ecosystem. This is actually a really interesting story of the Southwest willow flycatcher versus uh, invasion ecologists wanting to um, try to eradicate tamarisk. So it turns out that there is a lot of work. So again, tamarisk is that same species. It's using tons of water and invading lots of these riparian habitats all along. So here's our Colorado River watershed down here. Um, and they, the um, biologists spent a lot of time developing a biocontrol agent for tamarisk. So some sort of tamarisk beetle that specializes on tamarisk. And then they wanted to introduce the tamarisk beetle, but ended up in an extensive court battle about this because an endangered species, so the Southwest willow flycatcher, this little guy here, was breeding um, in the same area. And the Southwest willow flycatcher is a riparian specialist. It would prefer to be breeding in cottonwoods and willows, sort of the native vegetation, but in a bunch of these areas where tamarisk had outcompeted those native trees, uh, the Southwest willow flycatcher was breeding in tamarisk. And so that this uh, created a long battle between invasive species managers and wildlife managers over whether the biocontrol agent should be released or not um, in terms of how it would affect Southwest willow flycatcher habitat and eventually somebody released the biocontrol agent, but it was not through official channels. Um, so uh, the biocontrol agent is out there. The good thing from what I've read is that it does not appear that having that biocontrol agent out there is negatively affecting the willow flycatcher populations. But you know, this is again, going back to who wins, who loses and are your winners, you know, is an endangered winner more important than um, the less rare losers. Okay, worth mentioning some of the economic consequences. This is from a very well-cited paper um, from, by Pimentel and others in 2005 that looked at, uh, you know, really just tried to do some back of the envelope calculations of economic consequences of different invasive taxa. And so came up with a number, if you add all of these up, of about $35 billion spent annually on invasive plant um, control and caused by invasive plant damage. This is just in the US. You'll notice that a lot of this, it, a lot of these dollars are coming from control that we spend on herbicides and other control measures of weeds in agricultural fields, in grazed pastures. This is all of the Roundup that we spray on crabgrass or whatever in our lawns, gardens, golf courses. 
So a lot of this is comes from the fact that we can actually measure, you know, how much people are spending on herbicides. But again, the ecological consequences don't translate super well into economic dollars. And so all of that is kind of masked by these dollar values. We can also certainly see economic consequences of insect damage. Um, much of that is on crops as well as, you know, in ornamental plants in our gardens. Um, but then some other ones that we can directly measure, like the, uh, the impacts of fire ants on, on people's desire to live near fire ants or the amount of money that we're spending on controlling fire ants. Um, and then we've also got economic consequences associated with different vertebrates. This one is a little bit squishier in terms of how these numbers are calculated because the bulk of this estimate of 45 billion is coming from rats and cats in terms of losses and damages associated with those. And the way that they calculated this was actually based on money spent by bird watchers. So they tried to take the amount of money spent by the, the dollar value of bird watching and translate that into like a cost per bird <laughs> of in terms of dollar values. And then they, you know, multiply that by the numbers of birds that are thought to be killed each year by rats and by cats, um, and a tiny bit by dogs, and then uh, it came up with these these really large numbers in terms of costs of those. So, uh, again, really really tough to take an ecological consequence and try to get it into a dollar value. It's just, you know, it's not an apples to apples comparison. All right, and then last thing I wanted to talk about is the grass fire cycle, because this is just a, a impact of invasive grasses, especially that's really worth knowing about. And the idea behind this is that as you add grasses, so like if you can see this sort of carpet of grasses in here, those are getting added to ecosystems like this. So this is a sagebrush shrubland. Um, in the Western US, this type of landscape is actually really common across um, Utah, Nevada, Idaho, Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon, pretty large, pretty large land area that's just this kind of shrubs um, as far as the eye can see. The problem is that once you add this grass to a shrubland, you end up with a continuous cover of flammable material kind of going out through here which leads to fire, which ultimately leads to just the grasses returning. And then you, you end up in this sort of cycle where the grasses burn, the fire takes out whatever seed, you know, seedlings of shrubs you might have recruited into that area and you're back to your grassland. So there's one particular grass that is really well known for the grass fire cycle and that is cheatgrass. Uh, or Bromus tectorum. And this is actually a map of how extensive it is across the Western US. So here's the state of Nevada. If you're looking for your state borders, this sort of like squiggly weird looking thing is the Great Basin Desert, um, sort of a biogeographical region. And the latest estimates are that cheatgrass covers over 200,000 square kilometers of this area. So for comparison, Massachusetts is 27,000 square kilometers, so, you know, six or eight or something like that times the size of Massachusetts is covered by this one invasive grass. And what it does basically is if you put a lot of water on it, it grows, it's an annual, so, you know, it's just waiting for whatever resources it gets to grow nice and tall and lush. Um, and if it grows nice and tall and lush, then it is able, uh, then basically it has lots of biomass. Lots of biomass means you can burn it pretty easily and that you can carry fires really quickly through it, um, taking out the native vegetation. And this is just a schematic of that grass fire cycle. You start out with woody vegetation or cacti or pine forest as the case may be. Um, you add fire, you end up with grassland, um, and then that feedback repeats itself. Two other examples are buffalo grass. This is uh, taken in the um, uh, arid desert around Tucson, so southern Arizona, Sonoran Desert. So these saguaro cactuses are uh, characteristic of Sonoran Desert. 
And this is the one that's behind me actually. So Kogan grass, the invasive grass down in the panhandle of Florida and the Gulf Coast, which invades pine forests and carries flames up into the canopy of pines. What's kind of unfortunate is that it really doesn't take much of many of these grasses to burn. So for cheatgrass, all you need is about 5% cover of that species in order to carry some of these fires. So um, in these areas that had no invasive species or less than 1% of cheatgrass, they were less likely to burn. The areas that had at least, you know, one to 5% or more were much more likely to burn. So um, a, another example of those, just like when you were, we were talking about the sort of predators, the invasive predators uh, for invasive grasses that can increase fire cycle. Again, one of those ones where you need to treat it early. All right, enough from me. So just as a reminder, you've got uh, the Lockwood chapter nine on ecological impacts of invasive species to read, and I will look forward to seeing you in class.